All right, everyone, we're back for part two. We're gonna pick up where we left off. Um, in 1985, Nintendo comes on the scene and they release Nintendo Entertainment System, NES. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and kind of kick off our conversation about this by showing you the early commercials. And when I was looking for commercials of um, this game system that came out in the mid 1980s, um, Nintendo obviously put a lot of time and effort into the marketing campaigns that they put forth. There's probably a collective of about 45 minutes of um, footage that they that they, they released um, in the years surrounding uh, the initial um, uh, uh, household gaming system. Um, there are some serious classics that were made for NES, and uh, probably the biggest name is going to be Super Mario, um, Super Mario Brothers, in, in fact. Um, there's also things like the duck hunting game. Um, but uh, without further ado, let me play you some uh, of the commercial footage uh, that they used to drum up some interest in this very unique and novel system. All right, here we go. Here's a, a commercial that was released in 1985. When you get hold of the Nintendo Entertainment System, when you master Rob the Video Robot, and meet the challenge of Gyromite, when you shoot the light sensing zapper, when you play the system with so many arcade hits, you're playing with power. The Nintendo Entertainment System Deluxe Set. Batteries not included, Super Mario Brothers, and other games sold separately. Awesome. All right. So this, oh gosh, what what a huge release. Um, and Super Mario Brothers was massively popular. Um, I am sure at some point you have seen some an, uh, original footage or have played um, the original, hopefully. Um, but if you have not, I'm gonna go toggle over to my other screen and uh, just talk, talk a little bit about what is happening with the music here uh, as we engage with gameplay and how it differs from Pac-Man and um, uh, it, it's, it, and, and, and how it relates, of course, to, uh, Dragon Slayer, which was, um, a, a, the, the big achievement of the, uh, early 1980s. Uh, let me go ahead and show some of this footage to you. All right, Super Mario Brothers for the classic NES system. Sorry, that's redundant. Um, but NES gameplay at any rate. Uh, so we're going to just go ahead and kick it off. Our introduction starts off and we are to hear the iconic Mario Thank <laughs> you. 
different kind of ostinatos. Here we go. Again, our introduction. Super Mario Brothers. Um, but uh, that's what our major gaming system uh, in 1985 looked like. And of course, Nintendo being so hugely popular is going to drum up some kind of competition. So in the year following in 1986, Sega releases their console. Awesome. And Sega is going to be a little bit different, um, uh, but definitely is a competing factor too. Um, at Nintendo and what Nintendo was was doing. Uh, let me show you some footage of what uh, the Sega was all about. So Super Tennis was a game you could play on the Sega that was released in 1986. Let me show you a little bit of gameplay from um, Super Tennis. So there's some introduction music, but the musical cues, which is weirdly pitched, is mostly just the interaction of, of, of the ball um, with the, between the two players. Same 8-bit kind of sound though, um, not nearly as sophisticated as the use of music in Super Mario, which has again uh, become very, very memorable and part of just yeah, I don't know um, common knowledge at this at this point. Um, in the year following Sega's release of their um, competitive gaming system, so in um, 1987, let me pause my tennis game. So in 1987. Uh, two huge games are released, Zelda and the beginning of the Final Fantasy series. Um, again, Zelda's uh, music written by um, the same composer who wrote Super Mario, really a, a gifted person in terms of coming up with some very memorable earworms. Uh, and the Final Fantasy uh, series marks uh, an interesting continuation of the trend that uh, Dragon Lair was going for, the idea of extended storyline and interest in characters. And um, the, uh, as the Final Fantasy series has progressed, uh, their plot points and uh, characters have become more interesting um, and able to be developed, of course, uh, further. But 1987 is the starting point for two of those really um, uh, big names in terms of uh, video games. So Zelda and the Final Fantasy series. Um, the next big thing that, that we have after that is um, a, a movement to a handheld portable system, and that is uh, the Game Boy that's released in 19. Uh, 89. I'm going to get back to, of course, the music of Zelda and um, uh, the, the music of Final Fantasy. Um, in fact, uh, uh, before I, I it, uh, Zelda is going to be a topic that I, that I talk about a little bit later. Let me talk a little bit about Final Fantasy and the idea of the, the battle theme. Um, uh, there is a wonderful uh, contributor to uh, the online um, uh, domain uh, who talks about music 
uh, uh, music in video games and uh, video game music theory, um, and uh, 8-bit is uh, the user. Uh, we're going to check out part of his, his video, which goes a little bit uh, uh, more in depth into music theory than my class typically does, but I'm sure you're going to understand a number of the, the terms that are uh, being explained here. And of course, I'll be in your corner and uh, explaining a couple of things a little bit further. But because um, uh, the uh, Final Fantasy uh, starts in uh, 1987, uh, um, I want to take a look at that and a little bit about how that, that story arc progresses, at least in, in part two. We'll get back to the Game Boy in part three uh, and Zelda a little bit later. So uh, let me pull up um, a little bit about Final Fantasy, the trajectory of Final Fantasy uh, over the, you know, the last couple of decades, and very specifically the battle theme, or sorry, the victory theme, the victory theme and how it kind of um, uh, works musically as a, um, a kind of in a way defying our expectations of uh, harmonic motion. So give me one moment. Okay, so um, ultimately, the place that I want to get to with Final Fantasy is Final Fantasy VII, a game that I played the original and I uh, have watched a little bit of the, the remake, which was uh, released uh, really not very long ago, um, about, about a matter of a month perhaps. Um, but in order to sort of segue into um, more current trends, I want to take a look at like Final Fantasy as a series. There is definitely a continuum in terms of some of the different sounds and um, motives and ostinatos that are used. One of them happens to be the victory theme. After you have engaged in a battle, if you are victorious, there is a particular theme that plays. Um, so this is sort of early footage of early Final Fantasies, um, which will take us on a path to discovering what uh, Final Fantasy VII's um, victory theme sounded like uh, as it was released for the original PlayStation. So we're going to not watch all 11 minutes of this video, um, but just uh, the first the first little segment of it. So let's check out the, the lineage of um, the Final Fantasy theme. Up until 7, the Final Fantasy games all used a re-orchestrated version of the original Victory theme, featuring a pretty typical 1 flat 6 flat 7 1 walk-up. This chord progression has been called the Mario Cadence because of its iconic use as the level complete theme in the original Super Mario Bros. <laughs> and now has become synonymous with victory music in general. The original victory theme's melody was pretty straightforward, using exclusively the root of each chord for the opening fanfare. The bass keeps this from being too redundant by giving us a little more motion, and landing on the fifth for the C-flat and D-flat chords. All of this is, by the way, I say C-flat so much you have no oh, idea no. I want to just it, say His aside doesn't really C matter at the I moment. Like um, but everything that we're listening to right now is... is After the two-bar fanfare, we get this jolly little tune. This is actually a good example of antecedent consequent period, which is a simple melodic structure that boils down to a kind of question and answer form. The first bar gives us our main motif, a 5-4-5-4 five, four, five, four over the 1 chord. This contour is moved up to the 1-7-1-7 one, seven, one, seven of the subsequent flat 7 chord, and then we get a slightly altered version of this phrase that jumps down to an F, which is the 2 in the key of E flat and the 3rd of the underlying D flat chord. So here we have our first full melodic statement, ending on a note found in the key's dominant chord. This is what makes it sound like a question, just like how in harmony a 5 chord wants to resolve to 1, in melody the chord tones of a 5 chord usually want to resolve to a chord tone of the 1 chord. Denying that makes it so the music doesn't feel complete yet, and it still wants to keep going. This is called the antecedent. The next phrase is an exact duplicate of the first, except instead of running down to an F, we jump up to an E-flat, the tonic. The tonic, being the most stable note in a scale, is the perfect choice for when you want a phrase to sound finished. It's nice and resolved, and it doesn't feel like it has to keep going. This is the consequent. Think of the first phrase as asking a question, and the second phrase as giving the answer. 
Nobuo Uematsu doesn't perfectly stick to this structure though, and we'll see why in a minute. To keep cohesiveness with the intro, Uematsu exclusively uses the 1, flat 7, and flat 6 chords in the second section. We get a 1, flat 7 vamp for most of it, very common for heroic and fantasy music, but then on the last bar over our nice resolved E flat in the melody, we get this flat 6 chord out of left field, undercutting the melodic resolution. Here's what it would sound like with a more typical 5-1 ending. Now, back to the Uematsu version. Playing with our expectations as listeners is the mark of a really great composer. I thought this video was about Final Fantasy VII. Okay, okay, okay. On the note of playing with our expectations, let's take a look at the Final Fantasy VII Victory Fanfare. The opening melody is completely preserved from the original theme and sets the expectation that we're in for a little more of the same. The first bar is pretty much the same as the original, with just a little bit of foreshadowing for what's to come with the alteration of the flat 6 chord. Instead of a straight A-flat major, we get an A-flat sus, which introduces us to the D-flat note. This note is reinforced in the bass, making it an A-flat sus over D-flat. This is foreshadowing because instead of resolving nicely to the 1, the flat 7 deceptively resolves up to the flat 2 D-flat major. Hearing the D-flat note introduced a bar earlier keeps this deceptive resolution sounding cohesive to the rest of the music, but it's still such a surprising move that it catches us totally off guard. The melody resolving to the tonic, or at least what we thought was the tonic, adds to the shock of this resolution, and it works because the 1 of the 1 chord becomes the major 7 of the flat 2 chord. This sort of deceptive resolution is pretty common in jazz settings. What adds to it in this song is the fact that the melody entirely fits into the D-flat major scale, so even though it's a surprising move, it doesn't sound like it's a mistake. Also, look at the way the inner voices slide around in these first two bars, especially this bottom voice. After jumping down to foreshadow the D-flat, it moves up by a semitone before giving us this ascending line that seamlessly lands on the ninth of the flat 2 chord as part of this awesome voicing. What that boils down to is that we have some ideas that are really influenced by jazz harmony. Um, the idea of really mm, leaning into dissonance and giving something a sense of, of resolution. And what's nice about the victory theme um, throughout the Final Fantasies is that um, we're not just using this strict, um, what we call a credential structure, to give us a point of resolution. It's like giving us half a feeling of resolution yes you so like the idea is that in an auditory sort of way we're like yes this is um the end of the battle but like it feels like only a smaller thing in a, a larger sort of story that there are other things to kind of conquer it, it's not like the most final of all cadences um when i'm talking about like the most final of all cadences Recall when we talked about Sonata Allegro form and the idea of going uh, to, to the coda where everyone is moving in monophonic texture and reiterating one five one five one five one. There's like no mistaking that that's the end of the piece. But there are other cadences throughout the, the first movement um, uh, of, of a symphony and, and other movements, of course, that are like pauses, stepping stones, um, uh, just uh, not not quite as final as the very ending. And part of that is the thing that we're listening to that's at play at the in the Final Fantasy victory theme. The idea that like, yes, there's a sense of resolution, but it's not like the most satisfying and gratifying sense of resolution. We're going to save that for the end. Um, Awesome. So that's that's a little bit about Final Fantasy, and th at least the early version gave you an idea as to what it sounded like um, on the original gaming system. Um, again, 8-bit sound. And what's happening in general in terms of our tra trajectory is like 8-bit sound is going to give way to 16-bit sound, to 32-bit sound, to 64-bit sound. Hopefully 64-bit sound, you're like, wait, 64. The Nintendo 64! 64 bit. So like, like th that is like our, our ultimate, like, and we, we start having a um, interesting divide uh, again between going from a, a cartridge system uh, to something that's going to involve discs. Um, before we move on to essentially the Nintendo 64 and uh, PlayStation um, 
uh, divide that happens in, in gaming, kind of like the Mac and PC sort of thing um, that also happened um, or is still happening, I'm not quite sure. Um, I want to take a quick look at uh, what happens in terms of portable gaming. I alluded to this right before talking about the Final Fantasy theme, and that is in 1989, uh, Nintendo ups their game and releases the Game Boy. And the Game Boy is huge because it is something that you can take on the go. Uh, here is some um, uh, footage of the original Game Boy. All right, here's an infomercial on the Game Boy the year it was released in 1989. Honey, where's Andrew? He's playing Nintendo. You better unplug the system. Come, there you are, Andrew. Come on, let's go. Let's go. Dad, wait, let's go. Let's go. Time to go. go. Lots of Dad, oh, we gotta go, buddy. Come on, come on. Dad, come on. Come on. Dad. Champa's waiting for us, everybody's waiting. Come on, let's go, the bus is coming. Come on, come on. Come on. The secret to Nintendo's success lies in bringing arcade game quality into the home. Taking it out of the home is another story. You can take it to the lake. You can take it on a date. Compact video game system for portable handheld video action. Completely self-contained, Game Boy features patented Nintendo controls, a cross-key joystick, AB start and select buttons, screen contrast, and volume control. Powerful CPU and microprocessors allow complex scrolling backgrounds, hundreds of images, and exciting play. Digital stereo sound with personal earphones, battery, power indicator, Tetris game pack, and exciting video. So that's uh, where we won't watch the three and a half minute video about the Nintendo uh, Game Boy. But the, the, obviously the big selling point was that it was portable and you could take it anywhere. Um, We've already reviewed a little bit of Mario, um, and obviously you can now take Mario on the go uh, with the Game Boy, but uh, one of the other uh, games that uh, put Game Boy on the map was the uh, puzzle game Tetris. So before we close off this segment, if you don't know Tetris, um, this is what Tetris looked like for the original Game Boy. Okay, here is a little bit of Tetris for the original Game Boy.
Game Boy. When we come back for part three, we will talk more in depth about Zelda. Uh, specifically, we're going to take a look at Ocarina of Time, um, released for Nintendo 64. We'll also take a closer look at uh, Final Fantasy VII, which was released for the original PlayStation, uh, and talk a little bit later about current trends that are happening um, in video games. There's lots of them that are going on in independent video games. Uh, I want to talk uh, at the, the very end a little bit about the Untitled Goose game. So I will see you guys for part three shortly.